Welcome Oasis City family. And thank you, Pastor Lindsay, for doing that. You know, my wife and I want you to know how important it is for us to gather together, even though we are separated um, geographically, we can be together around the Lord's table. We're together in worship. We worship together each Sunday. And when we sing those songs, I close my eyes, just like Lindsay was saying, that we just think about those of us that we're missing being around us. We can hear your voices and, and, and just encourage the hustle and bustle that we're gonna be together again. We're preparing for that. We're thinking about it. We're excited about it. Um, that day will come and we'll be together again. So don't lose hope. My grandmother used to say, Brandon, when you feel like you're at the end of your rope, tie a knot and hold on. And I just wanna encourage you to tie a knot and hold on. Have hope that God is doing something good. We've been doing a series on hope. Hope um, and what to expect while we're expecting. And hope and expectation are linked. The cultural definition of hope has quickly become um, tied to the concept of throwing pennies in a wishing well, making wishes. But we want to encourage you to remember today that hope is not wishing. Bible hope, come on, somebody say Bible hope. Bible hope is confident expectation. And we can add leading to joyful anticipation that God is up to something good and something good is about to happen. I want to say thank you to our teams, our worship teams, our kids teams, our tech teams, video teams, our pastoral care team. If you need someone to talk to, we are here for you. We're still meeting with people. Um, uh, pastoral care is still happening. Lindsay and I are excited about a few groups. We're getting excited about a marriage group. If you want to just have a refresher, we would love to have, we're calling it a marriage support group night. So it'll be um, on our website, um, doing the Symbus program together. Some of you have done it, ask around. It's exciting. It will, something good will come out of that. And it is an investment in your marriage. And how many know after COVID and being locked up together, we could all use a little refresher, a, a little, a little uh, sprucing up in the marriage department. Um, also, just want to encourage you to keep your eye on the online groups. It's important to see each other's faces. Um, thank you to the worship teams. Thank you to you who gather at uh, 10 o'clock together, uh, 9.30 for kids, 10 o'clock for main service, that you're gathering at the same time. And being together is very important, and I want to thank you for your faithfulness in that. Now, if you're watching this after the fact, because that's your tradition, thank you for being faithful and taking part in the worship. If you're watching right now, and it is church time, and you're like watching, there's people commenting in the chat, and it's just not you, I want to encourage you um, that maybe just saying hi uh, from your household representing there, it lets people know they're not alone, we're in this together, and it is encouraging for those who aren't confident enough to say hey on the chat that someone is there with them at the time that they're taking part in our service. And we want to welcome you if you've never been to the actual Oasis City Church. We have a fantastic, some of the best people in the world are part of Oasis City. And so we want to encourage you, hold on, that time will come, we'll be together, and you're going to love to meet your new family. And you've maybe joined while we're just online. And that day will come. And I want to say thank you to those who have faithfully committed to financial support, even though we are not meeting in person. That's tough because, you know, you're not feeling that same rhythm of being with the people of God, with being... Um, charged up with that social interaction. But some of you, I just want to say thank you uh, for the faithfulness of your giving and the fact that even though um, you, you know, it doesn't necessarily feel like there's anything really going on. You know that there is a, that the church is not closed, that the kingdom is still advancing and that we are still at the work and about the, the, the master's work. We're still about this, the work of the gospel and the kingdom and that your faithful support is making that possible. So thank you very much for those of you who have not stopped meeting together, stopped giving, and stopped serving, and stopped making yourself available to each other, even if it's online. Next week, communion will be one table in many places. Get ready for that. Set aside some bread and some juice, or come and get your elements here if you'd like the ones that we have. We have them for you, and if you don't go out, we'll bring them to you. Okay, so make sure you take advantage of that. We're open 9 to 3, Monday to Friday next week. This week, we're going into hope for identity. Last week, we were talking about hope in dry places. 
I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Come on. How many believe the rain of the Holy Spirit is about to pour out over our nation? I believe that. I believe that we're about to step into a season of reviving of the church. A revival as things have shaken now. Um, that, that there's a reviving about to take place. And I, and I really i am looking forward to hearing the stories of what God is up to over these next few months. The sound of abundance of rain. You might feel dry today, but you are not going to die. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Um, we we talk about what to expect while we're expecting, and it's kind of a play on the book from that was famous in the 90s, I believe. My wife and I had a copy when we were um, making a family and 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 and, and, and had. Malachi on his way. We were we had our first copy of what to expect while you're expecting. And it was all about um, helping us to understand um, the different stages of the pregnancy and all those things. But we were expecting a baby, so we started to look toward that day. And and I want to just encourage you that hope is confident expectation. We need to wake up in the morning not not afraid that nothing good is happening, but know that God is up to something good, and we want to partner with Him in what He's doing in the earth. And so let's just keep moving forward in this series. What to expect while we're expecting, while we're walking in hope and anticipation. And last week was hope in dry places. This week is hope for identity. The identity of the culture is is come under attack. People in in my life, uh, people uh, that we that we've heard crying out, "Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, do I matter?" There seems to be a cry for identity on social media. There seems to be um, a, a, a desperate. Um, desire not to be missed or forgotten, doing something significant. Identity matters. Identity could be defined in a modern context as a sense of self. Who am I? Or a sense of worth. Do I matter? And I want to let you know today, you matter to God. You matter to the Lord. He loves you. You matter. You may feel like you don't matter to anyone in your world, but God says you matter. Someone named you. Like it or not, someone gave you your birth name. Lindsay and I have four amazing kids, and we, when we prepared for each special arrival, we would do things like we would purchase special items, uh, we would purchase special furniture, we would purchase special toys. Sometimes they were they were uh, secondhand but in good condition. We planned to find a special place for that new human to dwell. We had to carve out some real estate, make a bed for them, get everything ready as we expected the arrival of our children. But the most important uh, thing on our prenatal to-do list was choosing a name. We had different names that we brought to the table for girls and for boys. Um, people name their kids under different reasons. There's a myriad of reasons why people name. Some of you were named after a beloved family member. Some of you were named after a celebrity or after a president or after uh, a king. Some of you were named after a Bible character because, you know, the folks hoped maybe that that amazing character would would rub off on you. Some of you were named um, after traditional names, like Catholic tradition would probably have a lot more Marys than other traditions. Um, did, whatever the reason that you were named, uh, oh, here's one more. Some of you were named because you're, uh, you know, your family, your parents were so excited that they, you know, you're a junior or a second or a third, you know, a namesake. And so whatever the reason that you were named, it's the hope of the namer that the person being named, that the name we give will help inform their destiny and help create a, uh, you know, a life for them because we feel that names are important. Now, I do know that some people are born in obscurity or they, they weren't named by the person that they were born to, but they were named by their new family or they were named by somebody else who took an interest or cared. And names matter. Names matter. But here's the thing, even in the most loving homes, optimistic ideas about the future are oftentimes those names that we give or that we've been given are um, become synonymous not with the, the great person they were named after, but with names like stupid or disappointment or good for nothing or accident or hopeless. There's no hope. Even though that name was connected to something great, now that name is connected to something not so great. Isn't this just like the devil? The devil comes to steal and to kill and destroy your identity and to convince you to accept the darkness that he and his fallen army live in. 
He will use anything he can find to twist and distort, and here's why. Because he can't create anything. So all he can do is take something and twist it, lie about it, distort it. He will use the caste system in one country to drag down a person's value or self-worth. And in another culture, he will use the comparison trap of materialism. Whatever the use is, he will use abusers of every and any kind. He will use lie after lie in an attempt to commit identity theft and to derail your destiny. If this sounds familiar, I've got good news for you today. Good news. Even if you've been the victim of spiritual, emotional identity theft, I've got good news to you. For you today. When you became a follower of Jesus and received salvation, you become a child of God. By virtue of your birth, your new birth, being born again of the Spirit, your Father in heaven has the naming rights to your life and He is revealing the keys to your identity and to your God-designed destiny. Be thankful today that the names that you have been called up until this point are powerless when God pronounces a name over you. Genesis chapter 35, 16, we see a bit of a naming um, issue. There's a, there's a big, there's a bit of a war, a little bit of a disagreement over how somebody was going to be named. You know, people name people things because of pain and because of anguish in their own life and they start calling people stupid because they feel stupid. They, their anger and they, they, they speak these things and they poison the waters because they're walking in darkness or they're walking in pain or they're walking in a fallen world. Genesis 35, 16 says this, talking about Jacob and his tribe and they're moving from Bethel to another place. This says they left Bethel and they were still quite a ways away from Ephrath. And when it, Rachel, you remember that name? Went into labor, hard, hard labor. I can still remember being in the birthing room with Lindsay and I was wearing a shirt not unlike this one and she was having contractions and, and some of you are already grinning thinking about this scene but I, I remember saying to Lindsay, you can do this without painkillers. Just, you don't need an epidural. You know, here am I coaching her on how her pain tolerance should be. I was like, she, definitely stepping outside what was my decision. It was absolutely not my decision to make. And she had my, she was holding on to my chest like this and a contraction came and she made us, squeezed her, her hand and grabbed onto my shirt and tore out a handful of my chest hair. I heard it go ding, 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 ding. At that moment, I realized that I better watch what I say. Childbirth is a moment in history of every person that has a story attached to it. And this story is attached to this one. And so she was in the middle of having going into labor while they were traveling. Not a great scene. She wasn't established. They were in movement. They were in upheaval. How many love living out of boxes when you move? And so here they are. And so she's, she's going through hard labor, painful labor. Somebody tries to cheer her up by saying, I got good news for you. It's a boy. And with her last breath, she's about to die. She died. She says, fine. He's a boy, I'm gonna name him Benani. Which means son of my pain. Have you been named by somebody who was in pain? Have you had an identity thrust on you by somebody who was in pain? Somebody who was not free in the spirit, somebody who was not free in following Jesus, but they were in bondage and they named you? They named you by their lies, they named you by their abuses, they named you by their uh, whatever happened to you. Have you been named by somebody in pain? This story is a beautiful picture of what it's like in the kingdom of God. Something of pain has tried to name us. But Jacob came, his father came in and said, you're not going to name him son of my pain. You're not going to brand him with that. You're not going to name him son of my sorrow. You're not going to put that label on him. I have the right to name this child. And he will be called Benjamin. How many of you know a Benjamin? I know there's probably a Benjamin watching right now. He will be called Benjamin, meaning son of my good fortune or son of my right hand of blessing. So here's the thing. We need to remind ourselves today 
that the Holy Spirit is constantly working to counteract the work of the enemy. That's a big point. The Holy Spirit is constantly working to reveal and to help uncover our true identity to us. He reveals, he's the revealer. And the Holy Spirit is giving us power to overcome the enemy's attacks. Amen, come on, somebody say amen, all right? The Holy Spirit is restoring the victims of identity theft. Philippians 1 verse 6 says it like this, being confident of this very thing, there's that word confident again, being confident of this very thing, we can be confident that he who has begun a good work of restoring our identity, of showing us who God has created us to be, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it, will complete it. He's not gonna leave the job half done. He's not saying if we don't get this done in 10 minutes, I'm leaving. He will stay with you and he will be with you and he will complete it through the ups and the downs and the relapses and the failures and the successes and the victories and the defeats. He will be with you and be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And one day the battle will be over and we will see him as he is and we will all be together in heaven. That is good news. So today I want to talk about three things that we can be confident of and have expectation and, and live in hope when it comes to our identity. Number one, I have confident expectation, Bible hope, that I am who he says I am. Just like the song we sang today. He has given me a new name. Come on, somebody say new name. I didn't hear you. Come on, say new name. <laughs> and a new identity. Say identity. There is a battle raging over our true identity. And the devil is into identity theft, but God wants to secure your identity. Come on now, secure your identity. And I want to make sure that you are reminded today, fellow follower of Jesus, friend, listen, if you're not careful, you will leave yourself exposed to identity theft. You might be somebody who is secure in who you are in God, but if we allow the darkness around us to take precedence, if we allow the fear to rise to a level where we are starting to bow our knee to fear, if we allow disappointment to take root like Elsie spoke so well about, you can go back and see that on, on YouTube. If we allow those things to happen, bitterness is to rise, all those kinds of things, if we're not careful, the enemy will exploit that. And I've met people who were strong in the Lord and a year later had given into identity theft. They had allowed identity theft. Why? Because they stopped listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit who is there securing our identity. They stopped allowing God to secure the identity. Here's some things that the devil tries to do and here's some things that God tries, that God responds with. All right. The devil tries to convince you to worry about the opinions of others. That's one of his weapons. That's one of his tools about identity. Worry about what people say about you. And God though reminds us that what he says matters the most. Here's another one. The devil wants you to keep your eyes on your hurt and your pain, which are going to lead every time to resentment, bitterness, and anger if we focus on our hurt and our pain. Jesus wants you to give and wants me to give all my hurt and pain to him. He took it all on the cross. Here's another one. The devil wants us to compare ourselves to media and culture and to try to be like everybody else. Dress like them. Buy what they buy. Say what they say. Value what they value. And Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. When the devil puts thoughts in your mind, you could call it temptation. The devil says you've got to earn it. You're a mess. You should be ashamed of yourself. You could never do anything right. But when God speaks, it's inspiration. And God says, I paid for everything. You could never earn it. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I took your shame. I love you so much. I am proud of you. The tr devil tries to get you to repeat the lies he has told you. These lies that he speaks, he wants you to repeat them because when you say them, they take power. Something powerful happens when we speak things. And he wants to use the things that I say, and he wants to hide them, and he wants to make me, he wants to get me to say the things he's saying to me and distort my identity by doing that. God establishes and reveals our identity in him, and when we repeat the truth of what God says, we repeat what God says, starting with, I am a loved child of God. The enemy loses his hold, and identity in God starts to be more and more revealed, and your identity and your protection against identity theft, come on, 
That's what happens when we repeat what God says about us. Here's some things you need to know about God's identity for you. First of all, God gives you a new identity that starts on the inside, not on the outside. So you don't look like a a Christian first, you actually change on the inside first, become a believer, a child of God, and it starts to change the way your outsides operate, the way that your identity is. Your identity in the natural is not derived from what you do or how successful you are and how great you become. Like it or not, your identity is tied to your birth. That's it. We don't like that. I mean, some of you are like, I wish I was born to another family. Your identity is tied to your birth. Okay, your identity comes from, but in the, in the spirit, your identity comes from, by way of the new birth or being born again. Come on, anybody born again today? That's how we receive our new identity, by being born again. And we receive our salvation and become a follower of Jesus. Our identity becomes locked. We've talked about this before. We're going to say it again. Child of God. Here's a cool thing. My name is not derived from shame or pain because Jesus took all of that on himself. Come on, you can hold your chin up and know that God has a design for you and a purpose for you and you are not an accident and he's got a great plan for you. And the last thing, my name is on the guest list in heaven. <laughs> you are known. You might not be on any guest list anywhere. You might not be invited to anything on this earth. You might feel like you are passed over, passed by, missed, picked last. But I want to encourage you, child of God, that your name is registered in heaven. Revelation 2.17 says this, Whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. Come on, somebody put your hand on your chest say, I am victorious. Maybe you want to do victory. Okay, come on, stand up out of your chair right now. Say victory. If we were in church together, I'd make you all do it. Make you all stretch your legs. Victory, I am victorious. Come on, because of Jesus. Because of Jesus and his love for us. Come on. I will give him. That person is victorious. I will give some hidden manna, and I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Some translations say a new secret name. And there's lots of discussion about what's with this white stone that we're, we're seeing this picture of, 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 of God writing our name on something. Why would it say a secret name? Some people say maybe it's a pet name. This white stone, maybe it's a nickname. Maybe it's something personal. But I want to let you know right now that your name is known in heaven. You are not forgotten. You may be passed over on earth, but you are important in the kingdom of God. You matter. You matter. And here's something, the, the white stone thing represented a few different things um, in history. Sometimes it would have a name written on it and, and it, would, it would be like a pass to get in, like an invitation. It would be like an invitation or, or sometimes it'd be held up in a court to create, say, you know, a verdict of, of innocent or all these kinds of things. But whatever it is, I want to let you know that the reason that we read this is that we have this assurance that our names are written in heaven and that we are on the guest list. And if, and for those who are victorious, come on, those who become children of God, victory comes through faith in Jesus and that's it. Amen. There's a lot of people that have struggled with the concept of identity as well, saying, well, you used to be so cool, but now you're a Christian, so you're not cool anymore. They think they're going to lose. You used to be so creative, but now you're a Christian, you've lost your creativity. And all these kinds of lies of the enemy. Listen, he's a twister, he's a liar, he's a deceiver. He wants to distort. But you need to understand something. Following Jesus does not change or make you lose your uniqueness. Your new nature helps you become who you were actually created to be. So if you're creative before you meet Jesus, you should be creative after you meet Jesus. If you're innovative before you meet the Lord, you should actually, with the help of the Holy Spirit and clear lines of communication with your Father, you should be even more innovative after you meet the Lord. So if you feel like you've lost your edge, maybe that edge wasn't part of who you were, but the creative process, the innovative process, the kindness is all those kinds of things. Some people, they were cool to be around. Everybody loved being around them. But when they became a Christian, they're like, they're the worst people ever. Listen, God is working on us all, but the goal should be that you should also be kind after. You should be even more magnetic afterwards as a person. Because following the Lord and getting the identity that God has for us does not erase our identity, the good things in our, in, in our person. And we don't have to give up our uniqueness to follow Jesus. He puts his holiness on it and, and he makes it and starts to bring out what he's designed us to be, not just what we are imagining the next step would be for us. And if we're not careful, 
oftentimes these things that we value so much, these identity things we won't let go of, can actually hold us back from fully stepping in as children of God, fully stepping into following the Lord, fully being all in followers of Jesus because we want him in every area of our life, but we don't want to give up that one. I would say this, be willing when you make a decision to follow Jesus, be willing to give up everything and then have him give you back what he wants you to have. What he gives you is way more valuable than anything you're giving up today. Your new identity doesn't mean losing your uniqueness. It just means you're having a new name. You're going to get a new heart. You're going to get a new conscience. You're going to get a new mind. Come on, thinking God's ways are higher than our ways. Learning to think like God thinks about situations, new emotions. You're going to get a new location. Come on, you're seated with him in heavenly places. He has called us to his own, to himself. I mean, he's called us to himself to be with him. And you're part of a new kingdom. So the first thing is we have confident expectation and Bible hope that we're getting a new name and I am who he says I am. Secondly, I have confident expectation of a new citizenship and a new kingdom. This kingdom will pass away. This world will pass away. But what God is building will never pass away. John 18, 36 says this, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would be delivered from the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus himself said that. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed, come on. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and that's the perfect will of God. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. Somebody say that. Say chosen people. You are royal priests. Come on, some of your Bibles say a royal priesthood. A holy nation. Say holy nation. God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. When we realize that we are not a part of this world, but we are just passing through. Come on. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his marvelous, wonderful light. Once, verse, 1 Peter 2.10 says, Once you had no identity as a people, but you are now God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Ever say God's mercy. Come on. Verse 11, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents or foreigners. That's what the Bible says about the believer. That we are temporary residents, foreigners, some of your Bibles might say aliens. I'm an alien in this place. I'm, and to, we, he warns us, dear friends, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires which wage war against your very souls. You could even say against your identity. Here's the thing. You're constantly going to be tempted to apply old and familiar ways that were a part of your old life to the new life in Christ. We meet Jesus, we feel the peace of forgiveness, we feel the joy of salvation, and then we start daily challenges and the actual um, day-to-day starts to set in and if we're not careful, we will drag in um, things that we learned that were not godly. We try to use old familiar things. We're tempted to do that, to revert back to what we know. I remember I had a friend who was training to go in a boxing match. And I asked him, I was like, how did it go? Because he trained for hours, boxing, boxing, boxing. It was a free, uh, you know, come register uh, amateur uh, fight night. And and he had been a brawler and a tough guy. He could fight really, like he was a, quite a fighter growing up. And But this time he was gonna train as a boxer. And so he trained hours and hours and hours of training. And the night of the fight came, I wasn't there. So I asked him afterwards, I said, how did the fight go? He said, <laughs> It went okay, except that when he first, when he got his first punch in the, that he reverted back to Street Fighter. He, he gave up on everything that needed to be done to be able to win this fight. He gave up on all his training. He gave up on what he knew in, in his mind was the way to go. He actually went back to what was familiar. Um, I, I wrote a Red Seal exam for carpentry this last year and, or a little bit longer ago. And, and when I wrote the, the carpentry exam, part of it was time 
getting it done in the right amount of time. And so we had a test plan. We had a plan on how to uh, finish the exam in, in time, do all of these ones first, then do all of these ones, go through the whole test, do it in order, and we had a plan. When I got in there, I, I sat down and went, oh, this is easier than I thought, and I got off the plan for a minute. And before you know it, I had eaten a bunch of time because I went away from what I knew to be right and went to what was familiar. If we're not careful, we're going to be um, tempted to try to apply old mindsets, old thinking, old ways of identity to the new identity that we have. And that's not God's plan. The only way to overcome the temptation to revert to old ways is in the confident expectation, somebody say hope, come on, that though unfamiliar, this new kingdom is better. It's better in every way. Can I get an amen from anybody who's explored the kingdom for more than five minutes? And Zane and I were discussing this message this week. I do that with my kids sometimes. They catch up on what I'm, what I'm studying. And he said to me, he said, Dad, I had this thought. It's kind of like when you're moving houses. Sometimes when you move houses, you have to leave things you like behind because they don't really fit the new house. And, and isn't that so true that when we become a child of God and we become follower of Jesus, there's things from our old life that we're going to have to leave behind. Listen, we have the confident expectation that Jesus has paid for everything we could ever need. Anything we need, any resource we need, any wisdom we need, any supply we need, that we're going to need in this new kingdom life. He's already paid for it and supplied it. Everything we need is already stored up in advance for us. And every bit of strength required to make it is available via the Holy Spirit. First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says it like this, As his divine power has given us all things, some things, no, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you by glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these things we may be partakers of the divine nature. Everybody say divine nature. Come on, there's an identity verse in here. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's a divine nature that God is bringing out of us that when we become followers of Jesus, we start to look like our Father. That's the goal. Third thing is this. I have confident, number three, I have confident expectation, that's Bible hope, that Jesus didn't just die to make me better. He died to make me new. He died to make me new. Not better, new. And, and so there's this, we got to remind ourselves, Galatians 2.20 says this, that I have been crucified with Christ. Our identity comes through death and birth. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that's this, ow, oh, hurts to pinch, ouch. It's flesh, toothaches and sore knees and hurt feelings and all these things that happen in the flesh, okay? This life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Everybody say faith, come on. Remember, it's not wishing 2.0, it's confident expectation that is the seed form of our faith. Come on, faith is the uh, substance and evidence of things hoped for and unseen, come on. I live by faith in the Son of God, confident expectation and trust in God, come on, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why I believe God came not just to make me better, but to make me new because he rose again. He came to new life and that new life that we have when we are crucified with Christ and we're born again, there should be something new, not just better. I want to ask you the question, is Jesus, uh, are you just worried about getting to heaven or do you want to actually have Jesus living in you? <laughs> this is a challenge today for some that you go, I believe in God, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want to have his influence or his control over any other area of my life. I'll give him this 80% of my world, but this part I'm keeping to myself. And I, I, I'm challenging you right now that yes, you are sealed until the day of redemption. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. God by whom you were sealed to the day or for the day of redemption. Christ is in you. Great. You're a follower of Jesus. You said, I, I love Jesus and I, I want to go to heaven when I die and I want him to forgive my sins and I want to feel peace with God. Great. Are you an overcomer in this world? Because he also wants to live in you. We are his hands and feet on earth. Have you given him your hands? Have you given him your feet? Have I given him my voice? 
Have I given them my time? Have I given them? Listen, having Jesus in our life guarantees us of heaven. We're guaranteed of heaven. Like heaven is guaranteed. But letting Jesus live in us guarantees growth. And, and we have to be letting, willing to let Jesus have every part of our life if we're going to see the growth and development and identity and destiny that he's designed for us. He wants to live through us. You know, when we become, when we start looking back into the old life, it's, it's, it's a waste of our time. It's a struggle. We try to uncover the old stuff that's been buried with Christ. I meet people sometimes that have gone well. They're really growing in the Lord. They're really growing in strength. And then they start longing for what was. They start missing things that they were delivered from. They start pining after a time when they didn't have the responsibility to their neighbor. They start thinking outside of their priestly or kingly calling that God says we are all priests and kings. And they start thinking about turning in their priestly calling, turning in their kingly identity to become grave robbers. Yeah, you heard me. Heading back to the grave to go dig things up that were buried and that should never be uncovered. As followers of Jesus, we need to stop trying to uncover a better version of our old identity. This is a big one. Stop trying to uncover a better version of your old identity. You shouldn't be doing that. That's the old man. And seek to discover the new identity that's been written in glory. Romans 6 verse 3. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading it to you right now. Listen. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we also can receive new life and live a new life. Everybody say, live a new life. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united with him in death like his, we are certainly also to be united with him in the resurrection like his. This is the cycle. Bury the old man, become the new. Not better, new. He didn't die to make us better. He died to make us new. Verse 6 says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we will no longer be slaves to sin. Some of you can sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. You can sing it over and over again and each week you have to come back and sing it again because you're still feeling like a slave. You're still feeling challenged. Why? Because I think you're grabbing the grave. The thing that was buried with Christ, you keep trying to dig up something from your old life and redeem something or make a better version of your old identity. God wants to give you a totally new identity. Trust him that he knows best. Being true to yourself, something we hear all the time in culture. Being true to yourself, be true to yourself. It's shaky ground and a hopeless pursuit for the Jesus follower. It flies in direct opposition to Jesus' direction. The new life and identity that you need right now and that I need is not found in self-actualization, but in self-denial. And the culture around us says that's wrong. They come at the church all the time saying that's wrong. You shouldn't teach that. You shouldn't teach that. You should tell people to be their best life now. Live their best version of themselves. Choose what they want to be. Do all this and God says, I have a plan for you. Would you let me be your king? Would you let me be your ruler? Would you let me be your savior? And I'm telling you right now, I'm thankful today that Jesus didn't die just to make us better. He died to make us new, but the identity we are looking for should not be just a better version of ourselves. And it, it, self actualizing coming to figuring out who you are. Oh, I'm just trying to figure out who I am. Listen, it's not found in self actualization or self promotion. It's found in self denial. Luke 9, 23. This is what I'm saying. This is Jesus said to them all. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Luke 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. I don't like denying myself. I like promoting and serving myself. I like being selfish. I like getting the last Oreo. I like that. But whoever wants to be my disciple, and I'm using a dumb metaphor calling an Oreo a spiritual measuring stick, but you know what I mean. We're out for ourselves. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross daily. Daily. You can't say, yeah, back in, I, I went on a missions trip in 
20 years ago and that was my cross and now I just do life. Listen, take up your cross daily. I forgave that person one time already, I'm not gonna forgive again, or I, I shared my faith and they said no, daily. Those people keep trying to take advantage of me, they say bad things, daily take up their cross and follow me. Deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, and this is what I'm seeing sometimes creeping into the church, people trying to save their old life. Whoever wants to save their old life will lose it, save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. In closing today, I want to read a quote by David Platt. It says this, Jesus didn't die to make us better, he died to make us new. The Bible is not a self-improvement plan. It is a life-transforming promise that when we trust in Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, God will give us new hearts that desire Him and His Word. Trust His authority and experience His love. God will give us, when we trust in Jesus, God will give us new hearts that desire Him and His Word. Trust in His authority and experience his love. If you've never experienced the love of Jesus, did you know that you can? You can experience the love of Jesus. How do you access this? It is a step of faith. But I want to let you know that from the day I gave my life to Jesus, I have never felt alone. I may have felt lonely. I may have felt rejection by people. I may have felt like I couldn't hear anything from God, but I always knew he was there. And I want to invite you today to become a follower of Jesus, to turn in the old identity for the new one he's promised, to be buried with him and raised to new life. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me today? Say, Jesus, be king of my life. I give up my old identity and I say, Lord, write my name in heaven. Lord, I want, to be, I want to be a follower of you. I want to have a new life. I want to have a new identity. I want to have a new uh, citizenship. I, I know that I am who you say I am, not what's been said over me up until this day. And Lord, I ask you to heal me from the wounds of the things that people have said, the identity people have put on me, that you would heal me of, and start to work in my life to help me not to cause pain to other people. Lord, that I would break the cycle of speaking pain and darkness and I would now receive your glorious light. Lord, that you would renew me inside with strength and power and wisdom and understanding. Lord, help me to feel your love. Help me to understand and love your word. Help me to obey your word. Lord, help me to be a light to my community and my family. Thank you for the identity I have in you. And devil, I command you to flee right now. I say Jesus is king of my life. You no longer have a hold on me. You are a liar and a deceiver and a twister, but you do not create my identity. Jesus has the right to name me. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to let us know that you became a follower of Jesus today, that you've gone all in as a follower of Jesus. We'd like to put some resources in your hand and let you know today that you are not alone. Go to our website, wasiscity.ca, and connect with us there. For the rest of you who are watching today, I want to remind you that even if you feel like you're not yourself, remember God has created you for a purpose and you can have confident expectation that when it comes to your identity, God is up to something good. Amen.